Welcome in to Outkick the Show. I am your fearless leader, Clay Travis. It is Wednesday. I hope all of you are having fantastic days wherever you may find yourself in this country or in this world. Uh, DBAP, unless you need to SBAP. We got a lot of different or uh, stories to hit here. I'm going to give you a roadmap right now. Magic Johnson and the Laker mess. Uh, bombshell dropping yesterday evening. Magic Johnson resigns as the president of the Lakers. Nick Bosa has deleted all of his pro-Donald Trump tweets as he inches closer to potentially being the number two overall pick and being drafted to go play in San Francisco, California. Smart move, dumb move, or just real life move we will discuss. Uh, The Big 12 has signed a new deal Uh, with ESPN, which prominently will be featured on ESPN+. Plus, will include new title game details. Is this a precedent for the future of what rights deals might look like in the college universe? Uh, The Democrats, are they being held hostage by social media? I'm going to hold this graphic up. It's today's New York Times. Fascinating article. I tweeted it out yesterday about how social media is not real life. And... Tennessee, my home state, moving closer to allowing and legalizing officially online sports gambling in the state. This is, I think, an utterly fascinating uh, move uh, in the online sports gambling universe. We will talk about all that and uh, we will dive into more. But we began with the Magic Johnson news last night with the Lakers. Just when you think that UCLA basketball and USC are the two most functional attributes of the LA sports scene. In strides Magic Johnson last night on a day when Luke Walton and all of his coaching staff believes that they are about to be fired. Instead, Magic Johnson steps down, says he can't bear to talk to Jeannie Buss in person, so instead he decides to deliver the message that he's going to step down directly to the media It's a crazy move. It's a ridiculous move. It's crazy even for Magic Johnson who had a short-lived television uh, show and also for Magic Johnson who had a short-lived tenure as Laker coach to make this decision. Now, I always believe when stories like these happen and bombshells are dropped that something else is going on behind the scenes. So I think there are a couple of options here. One, Magic Johnson lost a power struggle. And if he lost a power struggle, maybe that power struggle was over who the next coach of the Lakers was going to be and Jeannie Buss wanted to keep Luke Walton and Magic Johnson wanted to fire Luke Walton and he said, you know what, I'm out as a result of losing a power struggle with Jeannie Buss. If you're not going to let me make the decision about who the coach is going to be, then I see no reason why I should remain as president. Okay? So that's one possibility I think that would be rational. Another possibility is that something else is going to come out about Magic Johnson. And in this day and age, when everybody seems to be getting accused of everything, would it really stun you if another shoe was going to drop in the Laker drama and Magic Johnson was trying to get out ahead of it? And the third and likely linchpin that would connect all of this is that Magic Johnson's filthy rich. Why does he need a serious job like being the president of the Lakers when he already has all the money that he could possibly need in the world? Why does he need more stress? And that's kind of what he hinted at. Hey, I've already got a great life. I'd like to be able to just live my life doing whatever I would like. And if that is in fact the goal of Magic Johnson, that's fine. But I tend to think that there is something out here that is more substantial. Now, a joke that was making the rounds on Twitter today. Magic Johnson overcame HIV and AIDS which he has had now for 30 years. He couldn't stand nine months with LeBron James. It's not my quote. It's all over social media. I have no idea who said it first, right? That was a big part of this story. And I do think this is an illustrative and uh, really kind of useful examination of how leadership can work. I think LeBron James is akin to Hollywood talent. Let me explain why. Typically in Hollywood, Most people who are on the creative side of the ledger are not great at the business side of the ledger. Does that make sense? Uh, Some people are. It's occasionally the case that you will find somebody who's insanely creative and also they're insanely great at monetizing their creation. 
most of the time what happens is Hollywood gives creatives free reign and they're able to let their talent flourish and then the business side figures out how to monetize it. What LeBron wants to do and I think it's an intriguing quest is LeBron wants to extend his reign as a talent as a basketball talent beyond even just basketball. He doesn't want to just be a GM or an owner or anything else. He wants to be an entertainment mogul when his career is over. Here is why I think that's dangerous for the Lakers. If you look at LeBron's history where's the most successful place LeBron James has ever played basketball? It's with the Miami Heat. It's with the Miami Heat when he went with Dwayne Wade and Chris Bosh to Miami. And if you remember the way the power dynamics were set up there here is what happened in Miami. LeBron James tried to rest as much power as he possibly could. He wanted Spolstra out as coach. Remember all the Spolstra drama? And then what happened? Pat Riley stood up to him and said, No, Eric Spolstra is the coach here. I'm going to back him with all of my equity. And as a result, LeBron James ultimately shut up and played basketball very successfully. When he recognized he was not going to win the power struggle over who should be the head coach in Miami and Pat Riley basically said no, it's not happening I am the captain of this ship then LeBron James had to acquiesce they went on to win two championships they almost won a couple more, right? It's an incredibly successful tenure. When LeBron went to Cleveland there was no figure in charge in Cleveland to keep LeBron James at bay. And as a result, LeBron effectively became the default owner of the Cleveland Cavaliers. He insisted that David Blatt was fired. He brought in a figurehead head coach in Ty Lue. And yes, he brought a championship to Cleveland but he also left the building burning when he walked out and bailed on Cleveland. He insisted on long-range deals for Tristan Thompson far in excess of the market. Same thing with with J.R. Smith. And Kyrie Irving saw exactly what was going on. Kyrie Irving saw exactly what was going on. He said, wait a minute. This franchise is being run to win right now but when LeBron leaves the building is going to be on fire and he's going to leave me behind. And so Kyrie Irving smartly got traded out of Cleveland because he saw what was going to happen and now the Cleveland Cavaliers are a dumpster fire. There is nobody else out there who is able to make an argument that the Cavaliers are in any kind of good shape. LeBron cared not about the future of the Cavaliers. He cared about winning right now. So now the Lakers are in an interesting situation. With Magic Johnson gone there is a power vacuum that is developing. And what needs to happen is Jeannie Buss needs to go all Daenerys Targaryen or uh, Cersei Lannister and take complete control over House Laker. She needs to come out get her dragons with her and be like bitches this is my team I make every decision here LeBron James I will trade your ass in an instant I am the owner of the team this ain't the Cavaliers this ain't the Heat you basically are playing for the Yankees or uh, the Red Sox you are playing for the Dallas Cowboys this team is going to exist long after you are gone LeBron James you are going to turn 35 you might have three good years of basketball left. The Laker franchise has 100 years of good basketball left. We don't really care about you. We care about winning but we care about winning in a solid foundational way. What LeBron is trying to do is destroy the young foundation of the Lakers mortgage their future so they can win right now. And the problem with that if you're an owner is owners can't make decisions in the here and now. It's why they're owners. They look out into the future and say okay this is what's going on right now but in three years this is where we need to be. A smart owner is not trying to maneuver a franchise in the minute in the minute of a season and trade suddenly for Anthony Davis. He's trying or she's trying to build a solid foundation which will last like the San Antonio Spurs where the players can come and go but you have a consistent franchise that is built to make the playoffs and contend for championships. So when I look at what is going on right now there is a power vacuum and LeBron James and Rich Paul will step in and try to take ownership of the franchise right now if they can. What needs to happen if you look at LeBron's career 
is there needs to be a balance to his uh, acquisitiveness. There needs to be somebody who says, hey, your talent, we run the business. You are an employee, not an owner. Okay? And so, does Genie Bus have the stones to go, to go all Daenerys Targaryen or Cersei Lannister on the Lakers? I question that. If she does not, then she needs to find a new president of team operations, bring them back to LA, give them complete authority and say, you run this ship, you are the captain, nobody is going to question you. Because that's the only way that whoever the coach is, whether it's Luke Walton, whether it's Ty Lu, whether it's somebody else that comes in as the next Laker coach, is going to have the ability to actually coach LeBron James if he knows that there is an iron will behind that coach and he either has to start playing along with the team or he's going to get his ass shipped out. I think there are two plays right now that the Lakers can have that make sense going forward. One is to trade LeBron James. Get as much value for him as you can right now. Build on the young foundation that you already have. Think about the next four and five years instead of the next four to five months. The other is you have to bring in an incredibly strong leader and maybe that's going to have to be the case otherwise and that person has to be given complete control over the Lakers. So right now, I question legitimately whether Jeannie Buss has the stones to make the tough decisions to replace Magic with an actual leader. Jerry West would have been a good person to be a president. So would, honestly, Pat Riley if they brought him back because he's got a relationship with LeBron James and he previously managed him well with Miami. The challenge that the Lakers have on a systemic level is that they have a a declining aged asset in LeBron James which is still a really good asset but every year becomes a little bit less valuable and they have a lot of good young talent that every year is going to become more valuable. At some point, and we may have already reached there, the young talent will pass the declining LeBron James. And I think this is the challenge the Lakers are going to face in the offseason too because if I were an intelligent sports agent advising Kawhi Leonard, uh, DeMarcus Cousins, uh, Kevin Durant, why would you go and peg your future with a declining asset, Anthony Davis, when you are much younger than uh, than LeBron James? This was my issue when LeBron James tried to make Anthony Davis to the Lakers happen. You shouldn't have the same agent. Rich Paul can't provide good agenting for Anthony Davis while simultaneously advocating for LeBron James. Because the best thing you can say for Anthony Davis is don't go peg yourself and connect yourself with LeBron James for the next several years because he's going to be retired in the future. And instead, the best thing that can happen for LeBron James is Anthony Davis goes there. So he's in a tough quandary as an agent. He can't manage to give them both the best advice because it doesn't actually make sense. Anthony Davis makes a better living elsewhere. LeBron James makes a better living with Anthony Davis. He can't give honest advice to both people. So, I am intrigued to see how this is all going to play out but I would say we haven't seen the final shoe drop here. I think something else is going to come out about Magic. I think there's more to this story than what has met the eye so far. Pause for a drink. All right, Uh, Nick Bosa. Nick Bosa, leaving the Lakers drama behind. Nick Bosa is potentially going to be drafted number two overall by the San Francisco 49ers. On Twitter, he has been an avowed Donald Trump supporter. He has also ripped Colin Kaepernick for kneeling during the national anthem. Today, he announced that he was going to and had deleted all of his pro-Trump tweets because he's thinking that he may get drafted by the San Francisco 49ers. Now, I want you to think about this for a minute. I like to talk about double standards. I like to think about the way media and teams and sports respond. If there were a player who was about to be drafted by the Tennessee Titans, which is a state that voted for Donald Trump by a massive amount, would a player who had been advocating for Bernie Sanders like crazy on social media feel like he had to delete his pro-Bernie Sanders tweets in order to go play for the Tennessee Titans? Of course not. In fact, if anybody even suggested that that player should delete all of his pro-Bernie Sanders quotes and that story went public 
everyone would rip the Titans to high heavens. They would rip the state of Tennessee. They would say, my God, this player, doesn't he have the right to his own political opinions off the field? Yet nobody out there is going to actually make an argument at all that there is anything wrong with forcing, in some ways, Nick Bosa to run from his support for Donald Trump and to renounce his opinion that kneeling for the national anthem is stupid. Now, my position on this is pretty straightforward. You are entitled to whatever political opinions you want. You should be able to go and scream them from the high heavens if you want. And if you are talented enough, it shouldn't matter. This may be a smart strategic move by Nick Bosa. But it is utterly fascinating that we have this situation that exists at all where a prominent Donald Trump supporter has to scrub his political beliefs of the current President of the United States. But somebody who was supporting Bernie Sanders would not feel compelled at all if they were going to a conservative state and they would not at all need to wipe out all of their political opinions. What does it say about the world we're living in? I want you to think about this for a minute. That a pro athlete is afraid to acknowledge that he supports the President of the United States. We're not talking about some creepy fringe politician. We are talking about a top athlete draft pick supporting the President of the United States who feels compelled to delete his tweets in order to be able to get drafted by a team in San Francisco. This is utterly insane. And the fact that almost no one is going to talk about it is even crazier. Can you imagine the outrage if a player was told that he had to delete his tweets in support of President Obama in order to go play in the state of Louisiana or the state of Texas or the state of Tennessee? It would be the number one story in America and everybody would have... They might have made the the owner sell the team before all was said and done. Oh my God, you asked a... uh, A draft pick felt like he needed to delete his support for President Obama in order to be drafted in Texas or Tennessee or Missouri or Louisiana? Are you kidding me? It would be everywhere. Yet, when when Nick Bosa has to delete his tweet supporting the President of the United States in order to get drafted by the 49ers, there is almost crickets from the sports media. My argument all the time is I believe in a marketplace of ideas. You have the right to put forth any idea that you want to, especially when you are outside of your uniform on your social media accounts. It's a crazy world that we live in where athletes are forced to distance themselves from the President of the United States in order to be drafted, they think, in the NFL draft. Absolutely wild. Absolutely nonsensical. I'm in disbelief over this. All right, so that is uh, Nick Bosa deleting his pro-Trump tweets as well as his, as well as his criticisms of, uh, of, the, uh, of the Colin Kaepernick protest. A um, couple of other in- additional things I think are interesting. I've got this uh, front page of the New York Times. Front page of the New York Times is here. I tweeted out this article. I encourage all of you to go read it. Uh, The article is headlined, um, Liberals on Twitter Don't Speak for Quiet Majority. And this may be a little bit difficult for you guys to see on social media, but this picture up top here is the blue people are Democrats on social media. Right? This is Democrats on social media. Here is the actual Democratic Party and the blue people have been put in here. Right? Do you see this? This entire article is a big premise that I wrote about in my book Republicans Buy Sneakers 2. And in the book I made the argument that social media was corrupting our national discourse because it was not in any way reflective of what the larger universe of people actually think and say and do. And I think about this all the time Because I go on radio every day for three hours. Radio, you speak to the masses. Television, you speak to the masses. Social media, by and large, you do not speak to the masses. You speak to a small segment 
of the overall population. And the overall population of Democrats on social media is not representative of what the Democratic Party actually looks like. This is why I have argued that in 2020 the Democratic Party is going to have a fascinating decision to make. Are they going to try to be popular on Twitter or are they going to try to win the election? Because I think those two things are mutually exclusive. That is why that is why if I were advising Joe Biden I would tell him not to pay attention to any of the controversies that exist on Twitter because it's not real life and the vast majority of the electorate is not paying attention to the day-to-day -day drama on Twitter. It's also why I have said in my book you can't make decisions as corporations based on what a few people on Twitter get triggered by. You got to the position if you are the president or CEO of a company based on your judgment. Allowing a few random people on Twitter to influence that judgment is idiocy because you are the one with talent. You are the one with the ability to prove how good you are. You know more than they do. And so the lesson here which I think is a really important one that many miss is social media is entertainment. It is not in any way a reflection of real life. And I asked this question the other day and I think it's a fascinating one. I'm going to do an entire article about it. Did you know that Pornhub is the number six most popular website in America? Pornhub. May have heard of it. There's pornography on there. Every day there are trending topics on Pornhub too. Pornhub is infinitely more popular and representative of what Americans look at online than Twitter is. Can you imagine if the media covered trending topics on Pornhub like they cover trending topics on Twitter? The stories would be oh my god MILF's surging in popularity this year. Can you believe all the stepsister porn that is running rampant throughout America during Donald Trump's reign. It would be ludicrous to do that. Yet it would be more representative of what people are actually searching for and looking up. In fact, I want to do a fun little subject right here. I am going to go to Pornhub.com right now and I'm going to tell you what the most searched for topics are at this instance. Alright, are you ready? Here are the most searched things on Pornhub at this exact moment. The theme, the, the trending themes. Uh, reverse bang bus. I don't even know what a reverse bang bus is. All right, I remember the bang bus back in the day. I'm not sure what the reverse bang bus is. Do you get off of the bus and bang off the bus? I, I can't. I, that, that's some of these things. I don't even know what they are. Back in the day, the bang bus I was familiar with. I have no idea what the reverse bang bus is. Hot, te hot teen, great boobs, ass fucked. Best titty drops in the world. Kenzie. I don't even know who Kenzie is. She must be wildly popular. April Fool's prank. Katie Cush, Evie Olsen. Oh my God. This is literally one of the trending topics right now. Melissa Joan Hart nude pics. All right. Those are infinitely more popular than everything that is trending right now on Twitter. There are more people on the internet right now looking for Melissa Joan Hart nude pics on Pornhub than there are watching AOC videos and talking about how brilliant she is. Alright? This is utterly amazing, right? It would be ludicrous for me to build my entire worldview around what is trending on Pornhub at any moment in time, any moment in time, right? Yet the entire media predicates all of their news coverage on what is trending on Twitter when it is being manipulated and it isn't remotely representative. Democrats are running their entire campaign predicated on what is popular on social media when if you look at this map on the front page of the New York Times today of this graphic the vast majority of the people that Democrats need to beat Donald Trump to vote for them are not active on social media. We are living in an upside down world. Maybe 
we're living in the reverse bang bus. I don't know because I'm not sure what the reverse bang bus is but this isn't the real world. Twitter is a false approximation of real life. It is a carnival funhouse mirror yet over the last decade the, the media which has become so overtaken like Narcissus staring into its own image has decided that whatever is reflected in Twitter is real life. It has dictated all coverage and I believe it has led to a fundamental pollution of the American political process. I love Twitter. I spend way too much time on there. I am a shareholder. But, and this is important, it's entertainment not real life. Just like Game of Thrones is entertainment. Just like Billions which I love is entertainment. You don't base your entire life on things that entertain you usually. You shouldn't base your entire political process or the coverage thereof on what is popular on Twitter. Credit to the New York Times for actually diving into this and confirming what I have been saying for a long time. Uh, Big 12 has signed an ESPN Plus deal. I am intrigued utterly by this uh, because I think we are moving towards an era. So for the Big 12, if you're a college football fan, the big decision that has to be made in the Big 12 is this. Are Texas and Oklahoma going to stay committed to the Big 12? If Texas and Oklahoma are going to stay committed to the Big 12, then the conference has a viable major conference Big 5 future. If they are not, then the Big 12 is going to be in a severe challenge. And if the Big 12 is in a severe challenge, ESPN is dipping their toe into an intriguing possibility here. Fox walked away from three Big 10, Big 12 championship games because they were asking for too much money. They were asking for too much money for the Big 12 title game. They ended up getting around $10 million each for the Big 12 title games plus some more for an ESPN Plus arrangement. If you are interested in sports business at all, the mechanics by which ESPN is trying to grow ESPN Plus is an intriguing, fascinating, challenging business environment. Because effectively what they are trying to do is while driving full speed with ESPN and ESPN2, they are trying to simultaneously have ESPN Plus catch up and then start to shift all of their assets over to ESPN Plus as the decline of the cord cutting industry occurs and eventually create a ESPN Plus digital, uh, digital representative that can be more valuable in the future than what ESPN and ESPN2 are now. They are effectively trying to, front, to fight a two-fronted business war. They are trying to grow ESPN Plus while simultaneously preserving ESPN and ESPN2. And this for a business study is an incredible challenge but it is also utterly fascinating to watch. And I think that the Big 12 could be a little bit of a canary in the coal mine here. Because I don't think that the Big 12 is going to find a lot of interest in its, in its product when it goes to the market in a few years. I understand the Big 12 thinks it will. I understand the Pac-12 thinks it will. I think we are trending as we are in many subjects in, uh, in, in American life towards a triumph of the best where they become insanely powerful and I think the Big Ten and the SEC are on a totally different universe than the rest of the college conferences. Their trajectory is surging while the rest are at best staying even. And so I think there's a possibility that Texas and Oklahoma break off of the Big 12 and try to join the Big Ten or the SEC and I also think the ACC network is an interesting kind of canary in the coal mine because they're launching it I believe too late but that the play may ultimately end up being that conferences like the Big 12 get a relatively limited amount of games that are actually on ESPN, ESPN2, FS1 and Fox and most of their best most of their games the tonnage not the best games but most of their tonnage moves to ESPN Plus under a pay model which may end up making them more money in the long run. And so I don't know what the overall outcome here is going to be but if you're not paying attention to the trend lines you are missing a lot of the story here. Which is that I think on television in the future only the best games are going to be available and most of the tonnage in other words if you want to watch Iowa State play I don't know Kansas State in basketball 
Sorry if you're a fan of either of those teams. That football game might well be on digital. Certainly that basketball game will be. And the way that they will monetize sites like ESPN Plus is by charging premium cost in order for fans to be able to go watch those games. It's a little bit like pay-per-view. We're going back to the future. So this is a canary in the coal mine moment. I think it's intriguing. I also think it's interesting that the Big 12 title game was only just worth around $10 million. Fox gave up the three Big 12 title games that had the right to air and ESPN bought them up but they only paid about $10 million each for them which suggests there's not a huge demand for the Big 12 title game. Uh, Finally, Tennessee is close to legalizing online gambling. It passed the Senate committee today. It's already passed the House committee. If you live in Tennessee like I do, I just want to, I'm not 100% sure it's happening, but I want to give a golf clap here for the state of Tennessee. All too often, we are not very progressive in this state and in the South in general. We're not looking ahead. We look to the past far too often. Online gambling is where everyone is going to do sports gambling. So all this focus on, oh, you can go to a casino in Mississippi and do it, that's fine. Every single state that legalizes sports gambling needs to allow it to be legal on the phones. And so Tennessee is going to become one of the first states to go online only. There won't be physical casinos. There will be just online sports books geo-targeted within the state anywhere you go you'll be able to get onto a sports book and place a bet if this bill passes and I know lots of you live in all different sorts of states but I think this is a progressive model that a lot of states can follow which is the benefit for Tennessee is there aren't any uh, legal casinos really in the state And so they don't have to worry about the physical structure of the casino. There's no group lobbying saying we only want it here like there is in Mississippi. Online is the future. That's where the tax dollars are. That's where you need to be going. Props to the state of Tennessee so far and how far down the process they are. Follow me or follow others uh, who who I've been retweeting if you want updates on whether or not this is going to happen. Uh, I love all of you. Thank you for hanging out with me. I got to go do television now on Lock It In. My name is Clay Travis. This has been Outkick the Show. If you enjoy the topics, as always, share the show or go follow me on Twitter. You can see all of the latest uh, that is coming out from me um, there. And I'll also share different segments from this show as I regularly do. Kisses to all of you. DBAP unless you need to SBAP. Thank you so much for supporting Outkick and supporting what I do. I will see you guys tomorrow. This has been Outkick the Show. Love you. Thank you, Facebook.